everyone. Welcome back to our RBC training. So today we're going to go more thoroughly into what we need to be prepared in order to do our DTT and then also give you a model of exactly all of those steps that we just talked about in our previous session, all of those components that go into DTT, what those look like when they're broken down, and then what they look like when they're thrown into a general teaching session, okay? So what I'm gonna start off with is our ABA performance checklist. This should be in your folder, um, so have it out and ready. Because I'm gonna briefly go over some of the concepts in here so that as you watch me implement this um, teaching session, that you can go through and say, oh, yep, all right, I see exactly what she's talking about when she, um, you know, says teaching environment materials or, or teaching were ready and organized or um, reinforcement was used, all of those things, okay? So let's just briefly go over this and then we can identify some things that are out and ready. Um, remember when we had talked initially about our DTT programs that we have that first crucial part antecedent, right? And so in part of an antecedent, you want to make sure that you have everything required um, and necessary in order to have a very well-structured um, and ready-to-go teaching session. All of your things are there so that when your learner comes in, you're prepared, you can start immediately making sure that you don't lose your learner and you keep them engaged and ready to go. Um, so as part of that antecedent, you can kind of mentally go through this checklist, okay? And take a peek at exactly what things you need to be mindful of going into your teaching session. And this checklist I find is really beneficial too, not only for the antecedent part, but then as you work through to make sure that you kind of covered all of your bases. Um, sometimes I'll use this with staff as an assessment measure when they're doing DTT just a helpful um, you know, reminder of all the different components because it's a lot. It's a lot going on all at once. But if you break it down or you have something to revisit, sometimes it's helpful as a, as a brief reminder, okay? So remember, we have behavior shaping. And here we have uses proactive teaching to promote appropriate alternative behaviors. Um, so if something negative occurs, maybe they stand up in the middle or they go to flop on the floor. I ask them to sit back in their chair using graduated guidance, give them positive reinforcement when they sit back down, follows a behavioral intervention plan as a, or identified strategies. So that there are specific things in their behavior plan. Um, maybe we have a student who is work avoidant, right? And they're used to hitting or pinching you in order to get out of doing work. And instead as part of their behavior plan, you have them using a functional communication tool of um, touching or exchanging a break picture, right? So that instead of pinching or hitting you, they exchange a break picture in order to escape or avoid the work activity. But that's much more functionally appropriate, hence why it was written into the behavior plan. But you're taking those things into consideration before you start doing your session. So I would make sure that I had that picture up. Um, does not use bribes or threatening behavior kind of common sense, right? Uses positive reinforcement as behaviorally, uh, at behaviorally appropriate times. We've got our positive reinforcement strategy right here. Today I'm gonna to be using a token board on a one-to-one -one ratio. So if you remember from our previous sessions and we were talking about ratio or interval delivery of reinforcement, our one-to-one -one means that per each correct response, I'm going to be delivering one reinforcer, and uh, for this, it's gonna be in the form of a token. So I've got my token board here, okay? And then as we go through here, it'll, it'll come back up with um, some additional strategies for reinforcement. So teaching environment, um, materials for teaching, we're ready and organized. I've got all of my things out. Um, I've got some of my program materials here, as well as some objects that I'm gonna be using. Um, I have my data sheet, I also have some of my programs um, that I might not necessarily be familiar with so that if I need to go back through and take a peek at exactly what prompt I need to use or what the error correction strategy is for that procedure, I have these right here 
for reference, okay? But remember, again, during your teaching session, it's going to be fast, and it's probably not the best time to be revisiting all of those program sheets because by the time you go through and look for the correct error correction procedure, your student's going to be on the floor rolling around or playing with something, okay? So make sure that you're really familiar with them ahead of time, um, but you can keep them out if you need just a quick reference. Sometimes I've seen, seen people highlight um, some specific things in there, um, but those are out. Uh, along with that, remember that you need to make sure that you have all of your current stimuli that you need, your program materials, um, written down and ready to go. You know what you're working with, right? So I know today that I'm going to be covering um, one-step directions, which don't require any materials because those are verbal, um, unless sometimes they have to do with manipulating objects and you would need those objects out. Uh, tacting, so identifying emotions. We're gonna do happy and sad. I have pictures of happy and sad here. Gross motor imitation. Um, this one doesn't require any materials, um, but then I have uh, word imitation. Again, doesn't require materials. Uh, expressive object ID. So I would have to have some objects and I'm using ball and car for these. And so remember, if I'm not quite sure exactly which materials I need, where do you go to get that information? You go back to your set list, right? And part of our um, program materials that we talked about, how essential it is to have that book that's fully organized. So you just open it up, you say, okay, yep, I'm supposed to be doing um, imitation with a gross motor activity today. And then you look down and you say, uh, we mastered tap table and shake maraca a few weeks ago. And so today I am working on clapping hands, touch nose and wave. Okay. And then you literally take those set items and you write them into your data sheet. And that's where I got for my gross motor imitation program right here, clap hands and touch nose. Okay. All right. So we have out all of our materials. Our teaching environment um, is free of distractions and um, reinforcers are located in accessible area. All right, so my reinforcers, I've got a little Mary Poppins bag here. Inside are a lot of goodies, everything from slinkies to squishy monsters, um, Theraballs, bubbles, there's a ton of stuff, okay? But remember, what you have in your bag is going to differ depending on the student that you work with. And we previously talked about doing preference assessments. And so you'll see me today kind of showing my student, look, look at all the fun stuff I have. What do you want? I'm going to be doing a mini preference assessment within materials that I previously gathered based on doing a bigger preference assessment where I said, okay, I know that they like these kind of things, so I'm gonna put a whole bunch of them in a bag and then I'm gonna use them to motivate and increase the value of correct responding in our learn. And remember those establishing operations and how important that is, okay? All right, so then we have our task. Task should be broken down and clearly defined. Um, another thing that I always look for is staff understand the purpose of the task. What's the intent, okay? So if you ever have a question to that, remember sometimes it's helpful to go back through into that ABLES chart where you can see a hierarchy of skills and tasks and exactly what builds on top of one another so that you know what the intent is of that program, okay? So for example, um, I'm gonna be using an identification of happy and sad program that's uh, pretty advanced, okay? Because our pictures are going to be um, what we call, remember, loose teaching or the need to generalize, they're a little ambiguous, right? They are not as sterile as something as this, black and white ball, really simple. No colors, there's no, is it a car, is it a bus, okay? Um, so 
these pictures are extremely simple and probably more for our very beginner learners, okay? But this program is definitely a little bit more advanced. And so the intent of this program would probably be more towards helping an individual start to generalize and learn the concepts from pictures and use them in reality with their peers, with teachers, with their parents, okay? Because these are pictures of actual people. They're not cartoons, they're not stickers, they're not things um, you know, that we're, we're taking from a full stack of verbal imitation cards or something like that. Um, so this is really more naturalistic. So understanding the intent is gonna help you better understand um, the program. And we're gonna mix up some programs so that we're gonna have some very basic programs and some more advanced programs today. Um, and then that goes into the next piece. Tasks were appropriate for the age and function level of the child. They were uh, varied at the appropriate rate for a child. Um, so today we're going to be going through some materials that are varying um, in ability, okay, because I want to give you a wide range of examples. Um, but for the purpose of today's session, we're going to assume that my learner is um, well into understanding DTT sessions, the ebb and the flow, and I can um, go at a pretty typical rate. It's not going to be very slow. Um, my learner has a pretty high uh, comprehension ability and they don't need a big pause um, in order to respond either, okay? All right, and so then the next part of our rating performance checklist is going to go into the next parts of DTT, those crucial elements, right? So at first we have antecedent, and then after antecedent, we have prompt. Remember, prompt is the direction, the delivery, okay, that, that we're asking our child to do. So for example, if it is going to be a tacting program, and I ask, what is it? That what is it is the direction, that's the prompt, right? And then that goes into the response piece, also another integral part of DTT. So then the response I would be looking for is car, right? That's the correct response. And then afterwards, I apply a consequence, the other integral piece, that's the fourth step. And our response is going to vary whether it was a correct uh, behavior by the learner or if it was an incorrect. If it was correct, my response is going to be positive reinforcement in the form of delivering a one-to-one -one token. If it was incorrect, I'm going to do an error correction procedure to show them what that correct response is. And last but not least, the last crucial element to DTT is going to be that inter-trial interval, right? So it's the moment that my trial ends and the time in between I start that na next task. And as we talked about, tasks were varied at an appropriate rate per child. So my inter-trial interval is gonna be pretty small because I want it to be more naturalistic um, where I'm really interspersing things at a varied rate, but it's, it's a fast rate, okay? All right, so we have all of those pieces. If you need um, further help or you want more information on all of those, I am going to put all of the programs that I'm going to model for you online again um, so that you can go through and you can actually um, take a peek at all of those different sections within each program, right? So what that antecedent is, what the prompt is, what the expected behavior is of our learner, the correct and incorrect or incorrect behavior upon the child, and then exactly what um, that trial interspersion is, okay? All right. So, um, last but not least, before we get started, I did wanna to touch base upon um, some things that you want to ensure your learner has prior to starting 
um, DT2. Now, on a daily basis, you have some learners that their behavior might vary depending on um, setting events, things that may have happened the night before. Maybe they didn't have a lot of sleep. Maybe they accidentally missed breakfast this morning and they're super hungry. Maybe they have seasonal allergies, okay, and they just um, don't have the impulse control and, and regulation that they typically do. And so sometimes you have to know that maybe DTT isn't going to be an effective teaching strategy that day because my learner doesn't have the skills necessary to be able to sit down and be available for learning. So you need to take those into consideration and we definitely take those into consideration when we have new individuals that come into our classrooms or new kiddos that we're servicing and we're putting together programs for them. Um, we're going to definitely take a peek and make sure that they have a few things. One, that they have the ability to sit for a duration of time, right? Because you can't expect to do a DTT session at a table or even do some four time play if they can't sit for any period of time because that takes away from them being able to make eye contact with you, pay attention to the things on the floor. If they are distracted by everything and anything in the environment or they just haven't learned to sit in a chair for more than two seconds, then it's not going to be successful. So then, if that's the case, we target and isolate out those behaviors first, and we literally teach them sitting in kind of that shaping process for a duration of time. Maybe we'll say, okay, sit for one minute, and then we can blow bubbles, and you set a timer for a minute, and then you get to blow the bubbles, okay? And then the next step is going to be sitting for 90 seconds versus a minute and so then you increase that duration of sitting longer and longer okay um, other crucial factors they have to have the ability to sit and not touch materials so you can't have a kiddo that's coming out and then grabbing 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 okay they have to sit have a quiet calm body because if they're touching materials while you're asking them questions or giving them directions then chances are they're their mind isn't on you, it's on the things that they're already touching. So they're going to be distracted and they're going to be less likely to respond appropriately. Okay. Um, another thing that they have to be able to do is scan. So that if I put out materials in front of my learner and I ask them, touch the red ball, that they're actually going to stop and look at all of the balls, scan the array, and then pick the red ball. Right? Because sometimes what you see is learners, you have, you have them sit down, you put out the materials, and you say, touch the purple ball, and they don't even look. They just touch the ball that's right in front of them. Right? That individual isn't scanning arrays. Therefore, they're really not going to have any ability to give you the correct response because they're just shooting in a barrel. Right? They're just putting whatever is closest to them or what's immediate. Um, so that's a really important part. You also want to make sure that your individual has the ability to do an eye gaze shift. So they make contact, they look at the balls that are out, and then they also look to you for instruction. Because we need to make sure that we have their attention. Okay. All right, so those are some crucial factors that go into our learner. Um, and if we don't have all of those, then we need to really think about if DTT is an appropriate teaching strategy for them um, prior to really breaking down those skills in isolation, teaching them separately. And once they've mastered them, then bringing them to the table and start um, applying DTT. Okay.